in my misspent youth, instead of doing drugs and chasing skirts, I was spending eight hours a day meditating, doing Vedanta when I was in my late teens and early 20s. And um, I had some experiences that taught me that this was really easy to do <laughs> because I just said, I want to learn how to do this. And I, 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 notwithstanding the fact I was raised a, a very devout atheist. I mean, we're <laughs> very, uh, the catechisms of atheism. Um, didn't fit in a test tube, didn't exist, end of discussion. Uh, but uh, at the most agnosticism. But after my near-death experience in, when I was 17, um, I had an experience of that state of mind. It was beautiful. It was this supernal state. I'll never forget it. Um, and I said, well, I really want to learn how to arrive at that state of deep peace and quiet and oneness, if you want to call it that, a sort of universal oneness, um, without having to die or, you know, or have a, something terrible happen to me, which is what happened, and then have a near-death experience. So I did. So I learned meditation. And uh, it was very comical because I, here I am. It was on my 18th birthday. And I, I only tell this story, not in any self-aggrandizing way, but just to give you a sort of a, a sense of how people entrain themselves to make things difficult when they shouldn't. So I didn't know that it was supposed to be so easy. I didn't know that it was supposed to be so hard. So I accepted it was natural and easy. So my teacher did the whole thing, and they he initiated me, and I sat down, and I immediately went into this deep, deep, deep meditation, and I transcended into samadhi. And afterwards, he was looking at me, sort of appalled. He says, you transcended, didn't you? I said, isn't that what we were supposed to do? <laughs> and I was... I didn't know that I was supposed to make this big gashry about it, you know, and it, you know, make this big deal and have to waste 30 years doing something that you can do in 30 minutes. So that's another lesson. It, you know, you need to sort of affirm to yourself, A, this can be done, and B, you can do it. If you think you can't do it, you won't. But if you say, of course, I'm awake now, why can't I close my eyes, or even with my eyes open eventually, be able to be in touch with the mind that is this omnipresent field. What Ernst Schrodinger said, the total number of minds in the universe is one. It's a singularity. So if you affirm to yourself you can do it, you will be able to do it. If you sit there with the little gremlin on your ego shoulder saying, I can't do it, I won't do it, I'm not Ingo Swan, I'm not the, you know, blah, 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 poor me. Well, you're not. It's like, you know, a doctor trying to put a chest tube in. If I, if I have to put a chest tube in here because he's just been run over by a Mack truck and he's got a hemothorax, and I'm going, I can't do this. I, well, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to lacerate all the nerves in his whatever before I get into where I need to be. So there's a certain amount where you have to, to give yourself a break <laughs> and say, I can do this because I'm awake. And go back to some experience in your life that's been intuitive or some experience in your life where you've experienced a lucid dream and then the next day it happened and begin to re recall these experiences where you go, I do have this aspect of the mind within me that is omnipresent. And I can go to that place and use it for good and to see things in real time that are going on now at distant places, but also I can see things into the future or if I need to, into the past. Why? Because Consciousness transcends not only linearity of space, it transcends the flow of time. And that's the, that is, solves the mystery of the precognitive lucid dream. Now the Cherokee, I'm a quarter Cherokee, my grandmother was Cherokee Indian, and, I, and their tradition is a big tradition of lucid precognitive dreaming, like at the Hopi, which I just learned actually were the people who, uh, the Anasazi who disappeared, um, uh, became the Hopi. And they would have these experiences of precognitively seeing the future in the dream state and envision quests. And what, what you find is that that's something you can do also. Most of the very important close encounters of the fifth kind, um, where we were going to set out to own an expedition to a foreign country or someplace, a week before it would happen, 
Sometimes more than one of the people I was going to travel with would have a dream of an event that would happen and where the place looked like, even though it was a place we'd never been. And it would be crystal clear. It may just be a flash. It may just be an instantaneous flash. It may be in that hypnagogic state, you know, the state in between waking and dreaming. That's a great time to practice this once you learn the science of consciousness, which I'm introducing you to here very quickly. So I went from aircraft sightings to this stuff. But this is what's really exciting. And at that point, you go, wow, I can be in that relaxed state going in and out of meditation, but also in and out of sleep and see a distant place, but also perhaps see a point in the future. Caveat. Anything that's in the future can only be a probable future. If it's in the past, it's kind of in chrysalite. It's there. It's in the Akashic record. It's there. If it's in the future, it's subject to change depending on what everyone, including yourself, thinks and does. And this is why when people say, on December blah blah of this year, X, Y, and Z is going to happen, I immediately know they're a charlatan. Because if they get that fixed in their predictions about soothsaying into the future, they don't understand the nature of reality and that it's this organic, evolving phenomenon that is subject to the thoughts and the actions of even those who have heard your prediction, including yourself. You know, it's sort of like the Heisenberg, on, sorry, it's sort of a psychic Heisenberg principle. But, um, so that is something you have to understand that it may be 95% likely, 80% likely, 99.9% .9 likely, but not 100% if it's off the, the now. Now, if it's in now in real time and you become accurate, boom, it's there now, be here now, or if it's in the past. But when we're doing CE5 contact work, normally we do preparation before we go out. So I encourage people to practice this precognitive capability before we go out that night, for example. Uh, and I encourage people on their teams to do it. And then, but when you're there in real time, you're observing with your conscious mind and inviting these civilizations to come visit in real time, uh, if they can, and if it's safe and everything, uh, if it's an appropriate group. Uh, and we always do this within the context of not dolphins at sea world jumping through hoops for us and entertaining us. We do it within the context of genuinely wanting to be ambassadors or emissaries from Earth and humanity to these civilizations without prejudice. So it's sort of um, a global diplomatic core of interstellar travelers, that's what we're developing, um, who, who understand uh, to get out of the sort of the, the orthodoxy and catechisms of conventional ufology, 99% of which is rubbish. Um, and to step into being in a higher state of consciousness, making contact with these civilizations without fear and without prejudice about who they are and where they've come from. Or even perhaps what they've done in the past, because the past cannot, it, <laughs> let's look at it this way, no matter how you view s these civilizations, the future is always different from the past. And we create the future now. Just remember that, very important. I mean, a generation ago they were, dropping atomic bombs on Japan and blowing up every city in Germany. Now they're our closest allies. So humans need to learn to get out of the us versus them xenophobia. They're this sort of the negative end of atavistic proclivities. Returning to this sort of primitive monkey troop fighting murderous rampaging monkey routine. Because we, we can't afford that. Not with nuclear weapons and not with weapons that have been developed from studying extraterrestrial technologies, which are a million times more powerful than a hydrogen bomb, which we have already. Scalar electromagnetic weapons. So that, that means that there need to be a core of us who are willing to put ourselves out there to be sincerely, with a pure heart, and without fear or prejudice, ambassadors to these civilizations, because they are out there. And you know what? They're waiting. Thank you.